In our second video for chapter 17, we're going to look more in depth at the enolate ion and its synthetic utility, as well as a little bit of discussion about reactions at the beta carbon as well. Yep. So what if we wanna form the enolate ion to use in reactions, right? And explore that synthetic utility there, okay? Now, this isn't a trivial thing to do because of the tautomerization we discussed in the previous video, right? If I'm trying to make an enolate ion, right, and I use hydroxide, for example, yeah, that's only gonna give me 0.1% of my enolate because in this situation, water is produced, right, which is a stronger acid than the reactant acid, the ketone in this situation. And our original discussion of acidity in organic one told us that equilibrium is never gonna favor a reaction where we're producing a stronger acid. Right? But in the bottom, right, if I use LDA, then the diisopropylamine that's produced with a pKa of 35 is a much weaker acid than what I started with. Okay, so equilibrium favors the production of the weaker acid. Okay, so if I want to use LDA, unfortunately, that's not something that's shelf stable. I can't just pull it off. So if I want right, LDA, which we saw in the organometallics chapter as well, I do need to make that readily, right? Lithium diisopropyl amide, how do I make it? Well, I start with diisopropyl amine, use butyl lithium, okay, and that produces LDA. Okay? I run it at negative 78C in tetrahydrofuran as a solvent, okay, and that gives me LDA with butane as a side product. And the synthetic utility of LDA is the fact that it's a strong base, but it's also a poor nucleophile because of those bulky substituents on the sides here. So strong base, but poor nucleophile. Okay. Then once I have it, I can use that to make my enolate ion. Okay. That's what's shown on the left-hand side in both these reactions here. Right. Use LDA, make the enolate, and then once I have the enolate, okay, that can be used to alkylate in the alpha position, which is a really important reaction because it's yet another method to form carbon-carbon bonds, which, as we've discussed before, is the ultimate goal in organic. Right? It's not easy, not trivial to make carbon-carbon bonds, and this is one method to do it. So how do we do it? Right. First, we have to pluck off the alpha hydrogen using LDA and THF right here. Then I add the appropriate alkyl halide, depending on how many carbons I want to add. Notice that this is an SN2 reaction. Okay, so it's going to work best if you're using primary alkyl halides or methyl alkyl halides. But you do have to use the strong base in the beginning here. Okay, you can't use something like hydroxide because otherwise you don't get a good yield of the enolate and the overall yield of your reaction is poor. But as long as you follow those criteria, right, use LDA to deprotonate the alpha position, add a primary or a methyl alkyl halide, then you're in business, right? We can do it with esters and nitriles as well, which is what this slide is showing. LDA and THF to deprotonate, then the alkyl halide. Okay? Then you alkylate in the alpha position. But the next question is, what if the ketone that you're starting with is not symmetrical? Okay, don't have to worry about that with aldehydes, but in ketones, I could have two different alpha hydrogens to deprotonate. Okay. And then we're back to a discussion of a kinetic or a thermodynamic product. Okay. And notice in our kinetic position, I'm alkylating on the left-hand side. My thermodynamic product, I'm alkylating on the right-hand side. And those amounts will depend on your conditions. Okay. If you're doing an alpha alkylation reaction, Running at a cold temperature gives you the kinetic product, negative 78C. Warming it up to zero C gives me the thermodynamic product. So what's the difference? Well, for the kinetic product, right, I deprotonate over it on this alpha carbon because it's more accessible. Right? And then show my two resonance contributors here. Right? So that's why that's a kinetic product. It's just easier to pluck that hydrogen off. Right? But why is my thermodynamic product over here? Well, if we think about the enolate contributor, the other resonance contributor that's not shown on this slide with the double bond right here, that's a more substituted double bond with two groups over here. 
So, and you can see it right there as well. More substituted double bond right there. Okay. So that covers kinetic and thermodynamic. How about enamines? Okay. We first saw enamines in chapter 16, right? We can take an aldehyde or a ketone with a secondary amine and form an enamine okay, with a trace acid catalyst. And if you have an, an enamine, you can react it with electrophiles the same way you do an enolate ion. Okay. The advantage is that it avoids having to use a strong base and the butyl lithiums to prepare that strong base because these things are inherently dangerous. Um, so if you have an enamine, right, just like we saw with the enolate before, it can react with an electrophile the same way. Kick a lone pair down, pi bond joins to the electrophile. Okay. So choose an alkyl halide that adds the appropriate number of carbons and you're in business. It's again SN2, so this will only work with enamines if it's a methyl or a primary alkyl halide. Overall steps, right? Take your carbonyl compound in a secondary amine, trace acid catalyst, make the enamine, okay? Then your enamine reacts with an alkyl halide in step two, and then, right, acid and H2O will hydrolyze the imine here back to a ketone. Okay. And we've seen now, we did an alkylation in the alpha position. You can do an alkylation, you can also do an acylation, same type of steps, just adding over here an acyl chloride instead of an alkyl halide. Now another thing we're going to revisit from chapter 16 is that activity at the beta carbon. Okay. It, we saw alpha beta unsaturated ketones and aldehydes in chapter 16. And if our nucleophile is a weak base, okay, that tells us we could add directly to the carbonyl, our typical chapter 15, 16 reactions, or we can add to the beta carbon, okay, which is called a conjugate addition, again, from chapter 16. Okay. So we have to think about that with these alkylation reactions as well. If I've got an enamine, that's a weak base, it's going to preferentially add to that beta carbon. Okay. And actually what ends up happening in this reaction is when we're using an enamine, we attach the alpha carbon okay, of an aldehyde or a ketone to the beta carbon of a different unsaturated aldehyde or ketone which is what this is talking about down here. A little bit confusing. And the product here is a 1,5 dicarbonyl. So two carbonyls, carbon one and carbon five. See, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, one, five dicarbonyl. That brings us to another named reaction. It's called the Michael reaction. Okay, and the Michael reaction specifically uses and enolate. Okay, so it likes to use diesters, diketones, right? Things with two carbonyls at the one and the three position, as well as an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone. Okay. The reason for that is what, like we discussed in video one, if we're flanked by two electron withdrawing groups, two carbonyls there, that gives us an extremely acidic hydrogen there in the middle. Okay. Then that is going to be, once deprotonated, a weak base. So it's going to undergo a conjugate addition and attack the beta position of your unsaturated aldehyde or ketone. This also forms a 1,5 dicarbonyl. There's actually three carbonyls in the product of a Michael reaction. Yep. Take either one of the ones you started with, call that C1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. 1, 5 dicarbonyl. What's the mechanism look like? It's about what you'd expect with all the things we've discussed before. Okay. Deprotonate my alpha carbon. It undergoes a conjugate addition. We saw this in chapter 16, kicks the pi bonds over. Okay. Then when I reform my ketone in that situation, I simply pick up a proton for the existing pi bond. Okay. So Michael reaction. See similar reactivity in a much more common reaction that's known as the aldol addition and aldol condensation, which we'll touch on at the end of this video and the beginning of the next one. So the aldol addition, ALD from aldehyde, OL from alcohol. 
And what this is doing is taking two molecules of a ketone, two equivalents of a ketone or two equivalents of an aldehyde, and bringing them together. And it's taking advantage of the fact that if you have an aldehyde or a ketone, you have an electrophilic site on your carbonyl carbon. And once you deprotonate in the alpha position, you also have something that's acting as a nucleophile, like we just saw. And an aldol addition forms a new carbon carbon bond that connects the alpha carbon on one to the electrophilic carbon of another. Okay, still a nucleophile and an electrophile coming together. So if you have that, it's pretty easy to draw the products of an aldol addition, right? Forming a new bond between the alpha carbon and a carbonyl carbon. Two equivalents to start, aldehyde or a ketone down here, okay, base to deprotonate, water for the workup. Now notice it is a reversible reaction, so you do have to remove this product as it's formed to drive that reaction forward with Le, Le Chatelier's principle. And another easy thing to keep in mind, two equivalents, your product needs to have twice the amount of carbons you started with. Both of these start with three and finish with six. Keep that in mind when you're predicting products. What's the mechanism look like? Okay. Deprotonate the alpha position. Okay. Over here, now I've got my nucleophile that can add to my electrophilic carbonyl. Notice there's a resonance contributor that I cut off here just to make these slides a little bit bigger. Okay. After my nucleophile adds to my electrophile, pick up a proton, and then I'm in business. I've produced a beta hydroxy aldehyde right? Beta hydroxy, because alpha beta position, there's a hydroxy group. So beta hydroxy aldehydes or beta hydroxy ketones are the products of these aldol additions. Here we see the same exact mechanism. Now the resonance contributor is shown. This is a beta hydroxy ketone because I started with two ketones. Now they are nucleophilic addition reactions. That's what's going on right here, a nucleophilic addition. And we can convert them back. That's called a retro aldol addition, something that's used in your body in glycolysis for energy. But if I have basic conditions, right, I can deprotonate the hydrogen off the beta hydroxy position that forms the pi bond here. Can't have five bonds to this carbon, so I kick back over, I form the enolate, and then with water, that converts me back to two equivalents of the ketone. One other thing to be on the lookout for, uh, in that beta position with the alcohol, we talked about the fact that alcohols can undergo dehydration reactions back in chapter 10. And in this situation, it's even easier to undergo a dehydration reaction because after we dehydrate, the double bond that's formed here, right, is conjugated with the carbonyl double bond. So if that happens, I do an aldol reaction, form a beta hydroxy aldehyde or ketone, and then I do a dehydration. So an aldol addition and then a dehydration together. That's called an aldol condensation. And remember that a condensation is bringing two molecules together while you lose another small molecule, which is water in this case. Easy to remember with a dehydration. And this is a name you'll need to know, right? This is called an enone, where that double bond is in conjugation with a carbonyl. Ene from alkene, own from ketone, enone. These can be acid catalyzed. They can also be base catalyzed dehydrations. Now, alcohols un only undergo acid catalyzed dehydrations in chapter 10, but here I see a base catalyzed dehydration. And that elimination, what this is forming, is called an E1CB reaction. Okay. I won't test you on the mechanism for this E1CB, right? but just know that it's different. You should be able to predict the products of an aldol addition or an aldol condensation, right? but just be aware that there's a different type of reaction called E1CB. E1 is the same E1 from before, elimination unimolecular, and CB stands for conjugate base, because it's a two-step elimination right, that actually goes through a carbanion intermediate. And in order to have that carbanion intermediate here, you have to have delocalized electrons, right? Carbanion.
carbon ion right there has to be delocalized throughout the system. Otherwise, it would be too unstable to actually happen. So what's going on here, right? Deprotonate in the alpha position, stabilize my carbon ion, then my enolate eliminates the OH, and I have formed my dehydrated product. Notice hydroxide is the product when it's at base catalyzed, H2O when it's acid catalyzed. We also have to be on the lookout for spontaneous dehydration reactions. Okay. Typically, we have to have some heat or a catalyst in those situations, but you can run into situations where you have a spontaneous dehydration, so you can't even stop it at the aldol addition. It goes through the full aldol condensation right away because the double bond that's formed after the dehydration is in a nice conjugated system. Look at everything that's delocalized there with this benzene ring, that double bond, the carbonyl double bond, and more of it over here. Nice, long, conjugated system. So the more stable the double bond is, the more easier it is to form, right? Form spontaneously here. So keep that on the radar. Always be on the lookout for delocalized electrons, aromaticity, et cetera. And we can do the aldol addition with different carbonyls as well. That's called a crossed aldol addition. Now a crossed aldol addition doesn't have a lot of synthetic utility because if you're using two different ketones or aldehydes to start, then you have two different possible enolates and two different possible carbonyls. So that doesn't have really good right, probability. You're topping out at 25% of any of those. Now there are some tricks you can do if you're trying to do a crossed aldol addition, something like cutting out an alpha hydrogen off one of your reactants. Yeah. That's getting into the world of the Kleisen condensation, and that's what we will discuss in video three.